Uh, go ahead and take out your Bibles. Turn to the book of John and chapter number one. John chapter one. Uh, over the last few weeks, we've been in this series called Christmas is Waiting. And, and we've talked about a number of different things about waiting and how throughout life. And we have all kinds of places and times and things that we have to wait for. We wait for our food when we go out to eat, wait for them to, to bring it to us. Uh, we wait for loved ones to come and visit. We, we wait for our uh, favorite show to come on or our uh, new movie to arrive in the theater. We wait for that money to hit our bank account so then that we can spend that money, right? Uh, at Christmas time, though, Christmas is all about waiting, it seems like. From one Christmas to the next, we're just waiting for Christmas. And, and so we wait. We wait for the presents. We wait for the time with our family members. We wait for so many things. That trip that you've got planned. There's, there's a lot of waiting that goes on around Christmas. And of course, I've said it many times in this series and other series, many times waiting is not fun. We don't enjoy waiting. We get very impatient when it comes to waiting oftentimes, but so many times we have to wait. I wonder in this idea of waiting and in kind of a different circumstance with waiting, I wonder if you've ever found yourself in the dark and just waiting for the light to come on. It could be maybe that someone turned out the light and didn't realize you were still in the room. Has that ever happened to you? And someone flips out the light and you're like, hey, I'm in here. <laughs> Turn it on. Uh, maybe it was the power went out and now you're just waiting for the, the lights to come back on. Now, I don't know about you, but like in my house, I know where everything is until the power goes out. And then it just, it's like I, I, I'm lost. Even though I've lived in that house for over four years, I, I know where all the stuff is. I mean, sometimes, as a matter of fact, a couple days ago, I, I, I caught myself doing this. I, I was reading some Bible verses on my phone, walking through my house. I was just reading, walking, walked from one end of the house to the other, went down the steps into my office, went back to my desk, and I'm still reading. I wasn't worried about bumping anything because I could see and I knew where everything was. And so I was reading on my phone while I walked. But now if the power went out, that, that would have been awful, you know, because it's when the power goes out, when the lights go out, that's when your shins find the coffee table that's been in the same spot for years, but you forgot. That's when your little pinky toe finds the end of the bed. Yeah, you know, I, it, it's when the lights go out. And if that's happened to you, you know, in that moment, you're waiting for those lights to come on because in that darkness and when the power goes out, that's like when it's like absolute darkness. You're just longing for the light. You're longing for the light in our house. It's it's really when the lights go out, when the power has gone out, it's made me recognize how much light we normally have in our house. When the power goes out, it's like, wow, I, I you know, one, I'm lost. I don't know where anything is, but it, it makes me recognize that whenever the power is on, there, there's a there's a nightlight in the hall bathroom. Uh, there's the light over the sink in the kitchen that's always on. There's my alarm clock that's got a pretty big face on it. And so there's the numbers on that. So there's all of these sources of light. But when we're pushed into that darkness, when we're cast into that darkness, we recognize the need for light. We miss the light. This morning, I want us to think about this idea about needing light in darkness, trying to find a light. As we look at John chapter 1 this morning, this isn't going to be a traditional Christmas passage. But I think you'll see that this is very much attached to Christmas because when Jesus came, he was a light shining in a dark world. And as we, we rejoice about Christmas and we celebrate Christmas, we look back about, at Christmas, we recognize that light that came into a dark world, that light that, that shined so that we could see the way to salvation. This morning, the title of the message is Light in the Darkness. Light in the Darkness. Even though Jesus brought the light that we all need, there are still many people in our world that walk in darkness. It's like somebody putting a flashlight into your hand in the middle of the dark and you have the source of light. You have access to the light and you just don't turn it on. You instead live in that darkness. And all around us, there are people that still live in darkness separate from Jesus Christ. But the light is available to them. And I want us to see that this morning. We'll begin in John chapter number 1, verses 1 through 14. Again, this isn't a, a, a Christmas passage per se. John didn't start with the birth of Jesus. When, well, John actually went a good bit further back. And he talked about in the beginning. 
And then he jumped ahead to Jesus was walking on this earth as a man. And so let's read these verses here. John chapter 1 verses 1 through 14 says this. In the beginning was the Word. Now that, that, that name, you'll see Word is capitalized. It's a name of someone. And I'll go ahead and tell you just so that you understand as we read this. The Word, as mentioned here, that name is Jesus. And so now consider that every time we see the Word in this passage, it's talking about Jesus. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. Now, pause just a moment here because we're in the book of John and it talks about a man named John. And these are two different Johns. The John who wrote the gospel of John is, is John the disciple. The John that is mentioned there is John the Baptist. So there's two different Johns just to try to provide some clarity there of who we're talking about. When he says there was a man sent from God whose name was John, we know him as John the Baptist. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men, and again you see light now is capitalized just like word because again, it's talking about Jesus, Jesus, the Word, Jesus, the light. That all men through him might believe he was not that light, talking about John the Baptist, but was sent to bear witness of that light, Jesus. That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world made, was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came into his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power. To become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God and the word. Now, here's the Christmas story right here. Mm -hmm. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the father, full of grace and truth. The Word was made flesh. Jesus was made flesh. Jesus, the Son of God, left heaven's throne, came to this earth, born in a manger, born in a stable, placed in a manger by his mother, Mary. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Word made flesh, the, the light that, that came into the darkness. So as we consider this morning, this idea of light in the darkness, uh, I, I want us to see a few things here about the light and about the darkness. The first thing is the darkness of the land. The darkness of the land in John 1, 5, we read that light shined in the darkness. Darkness is an absence of light. It's where you go, there's no light. If the lights are turned out, you're in the dark. If the power goes out, you're in the dark. If it's nighttime and it's cloudy and you can't see the moon, you can't see the stars, and you're out here in the country and there's no city lights anywhere, it's dark. It's the absence of light. And so this picture of darkness, this picture of the absence of light is found throughout Scripture. Beginning at the very beginning, as John talked about in the beginning. Well, when we go all the way to the beginning in Genesis chapter number one, we read in verse number two, and the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep and the spirit of God moved upon the face of the earth of the waters. If we go a little bit ahead of that, we go over into uh, when, when the children of Israel were in Egypt. You'll remember the ten plagues that, that God brought onto Egypt to, to uh, if you will, convince Pharaoh to let God's people go. And Moses was there and he was speaking to Pharaoh and you need to let my people go. God has said this and if you don't there will be a plague. And there was one after another after another. And, and there comes a time in Exodus chapter number 10 where God said, okay, the next plague is darkness. In Exodus 10, 21, the, words, the, the Bible says this, And the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch out thine hand toward heaven, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, even darkness which may be felt. Like that's a dark darkness, isn't it? Yes. Well, that oppressive darkness, that darkness where it, there's no hope of seeing anything, there's no light at all, a complete absence of light. 
And as we read about Egypt and we read about the Pharaoh and his, his disregard for God and, and disregard for God's people, we see a complete absence of light in Egypt even before this plague of darkness. But we see darkness as we keep reading through the Old Testament, we come upon Job, we come upon Psalms, and both Job and David speak of darkness in their lives. It was times when, it, when they questioned what was going on, whenever there were hardships in their lives, when it seemed like their enemies were getting the last laugh, when they said they couldn't see God, couldn't feel God. They described it as being darkness. It was an absence of light. In Isaiah chapter 9, a few weeks ago, we, we were in that passage. In Isaiah chapter 9, it, it, we read that the people in that day, it, this is a, a passage, it's a messianic prophecy, but as they waited for the Messiah, Isaiah 9 2 says, the people that walked in darkness. So it was a dark time as they waited for the Messiah, as they struggled with different things going on in this world. They were, they, they were longing for the Messiah to come and shed the light on everything, to, to fix everything. As we wrap up the Old Testament, and obviously I'm skipping around in the Old Testament, I'm not telling you every time darkness is mentioned. I'm not telling you every time that there was a, an obvious absence of the light. But as we get to the end, we come to the book of Malachi. Now in the book of Malachi, the words dark or darkness, they're not actually mentioned, but kind of like with Exodus, the darkness that can be felt. In Malachi, you can feel the darkness. As you read the book of Malachi, what you'll find is God reproving his people because they had gotten to the point where instead of worshiping God with a, a sincere heart and with an open heart and, and with all that they had, instead they had gotten to where they would come and they'd say, I don't want to give God the good lamb. We could sell that one or we could use that for something else. But you know what? I've got this lamb with a broken leg. I might have to kill it anyway. I'll just give that to God. And they would bring the broken and the sick and, and the things that they didn't want. They said, well, we might as well give those to God. And so they would bring all of this to God. And God said, I don't want it. And the priests, the men of God, who it was their responsibility to come before the people and say, this is what God requires of you. And it was their responsibility. If someone brought something that they shouldn't, they would turn it away and say, no, that's not worthy of God. Take it away. But instead, in the day of Malachi, they would say, eh, that will be fine. Come on doesn't matter. What's, what's it really matter? You can feel how dark of a time it was. Malachi is finished out with a pronouncement of judgment. God saying, I, 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 basically, if, if I could just paraphrase, I've had it. I've given you chance after chance after chance after chance. It's time for judgment. And, and at the end of Malachi, we just turn the page and we're in Matthew. They didn't just get to turn the page and get to Matthew. From the end of Malachi to the beginning of Matthew, four Hundred years passed. 400 years of silence from God. 400 years of darkness from God, if you will. It wasn't a literal physical darkness, but that, there's no light from heaven. There's no word from heaven that's recorded. It's, it's a time of silence and darkness. And that's where we end the Old Testament. Darkness all across the land. I don't think it would take much convincing to tell you that there's a lot of darkness in our world today. I don't think it would take much convincing to tell you that there is a lot of absence of light in our world today. As we look around, we listen to those around us, we watch the news, we read different things. All around us we see darkness. There's divisions at every hand it seems. There is constant praise for sin and rejection of God's righteousness. There are those that will call good evil and evil good. All around us there's darkness. As we consider some of the things, I mean, just uh, you, you watch the news recently. There were some cases before the Supreme Court and, and people would show up and they would, they would, they would uh, protest and they would chant and they would yell and they would cry out because they felt it was their right to be able to murder their unborn children. And they were so passionate about that. And, and, and if ever Roe v. Wade is overturned, there's going to be a lot of things that burn. Because they hold so firmly that that's their right and it's, it's the good thing that should be able to be done. I've even heard people make the case that, you know, that, that, that it's ungodly to deny this to people. And that's the world we live in, a world of darkness. 
a world and again things we've heard recently where you as a parent shouldn't be involved in your child's education don't you worry about what the government is teaching your children we'll take care of this it's not your responsibility oh, what a world of darkness that we live in it seems many times as we look around darkness might be winning it seems as we look around that the light that that is in this world seems to be getting dimmer and dimmer you know how it is whenever a, a light star a bulb starts to go bad I, there's a couple in our hall bathroom over the last few months i noticed when they started out they were really bright and over time they started to get dimmer and dimmer and dimmer to where at some point they just really weren't much use and i had to change them out it seems in our world today that the light keeps getting dimmer and dimmer if that were the end of the message though it would just really be depressing yeah it, Old Testament days, it was darkness. And in our days, it's darkness. And the light is getting dimmer and dimmer. But I don't tell you about the darkness to depress you or to defeat you. I tell you about the darkness because I want to tell you about the light. And so, yes, there's darkness in the land. But that's not the end of the story because then there's the dawning of the light. In John 1, 5, it says, And the light shineth in darkness. And it talks about Jesus being that light. He, was, he is, was life, and the life was the light of men. Later, it talks about John coming to bear witness, witness of the light, and that he was going to, the, the, the true light, which lighteth every man cometh into this world. It's Jesus Christ. It was the Word made flesh that dwelt among us. It was the light of God that came. Yes, the times were dark. Yes, there was, it seemed like there was no good anywhere. Yes, the, the light that still existed was getting dimmer and dimmer. But then Jesus stepped in, the light, not just a light to light the way. He was the light. He was born in that little stable in Bethlehem to, to his mother Mary, to Virgin Mary. A miracle, even in the conception there. A, a, a miracle of God sending his son. His son who stepped out of heaven, who said, I have everything, but I need to go to, go, to, go to that earth because they need me. And so Jesus stepped out of heaven, born of a virgin, in, in, a, in a stable. Not even a, not even a nice little house, not even a decent little hotel room. He was born in a stable. He was placed in a feeding trough, a manger. And that's where our Savior was born. But that is, that's not just how our Savior was born, but that's how the light came into this earth, how the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. One, one version says the, the, that Jesus was born, the Son of God was born and moved into our neighborhood. That's what He did. He left heaven's glory and He moved into our neighborhood. He, he came into the darkness of this world. As we considered those passages about darkness, in Genesis chapter 1 we talked about the darkness, that absence of light. But then in Genesis 1 we see God say, let there be light. And there was light. Consider this. God said, let there be light before there was ever sun, moon, or stars. You see, there was no need for those to be the light because God is the light. And so God said, let there be light. And he brought light forth. Uh, whenever we look at uh, back in Egypt and the, the plague of darkness and how that God allowed darkness to overtake all of the land, that darkness that could be felt when he withdrew all the light. When you read that passage, there was still some light. It wasn't there with the Egyptians and Pharaoh's household. No, if you went over to God's people, there was still light because God was still there with them. When you read Job's writings, when you read David's writings in the book of Psalms and they're saying, you know, why are you so far from me? And why is everything so dark? And why are my enemies getting the victory? And why does it seem I'm struggling so much? In both Job and David's situations, God spoke into him and said, you may feel, and I'm going to paraphrase here, you may feel like it's so dark. But it's because you've lost your focus on me. Look back to me and you know what you'll see? You'll see the light. Yes, the world is dark. Yes, times are dark. But focus on me. When we look over to Isaiah, and he says in Isaiah 9.1, talks about dimness. 9.2 talks about the darkness that the people dwelt in. We see that. But then just a few verses later in Isaiah 9.6, yeah, they're told, hey, there's darkness, there's dimness. But in verse 2 it says, The people that dwelt in darkness saw a great light. Yes. And in verse 6 it says, unto, which, unto us a child is born. And we see that his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, 
the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. In Isaiah chapter 9, they were looking ahead a few hundred years. Hey, it's dark right now, but if you look on the horizon, you can see there's a great light about to come. There's been times uh, over this last year, Haley and I would go out and go running out at the lake in Florella, and it would be really early. Time change really threw us off, okay, when that happened. Prior to that, we would go out pretty early, and the sun would be up. It would meet us there. We showed up one morning at like 5.30 at the lake out there after the time change, and uh, Haley was like, it's pretty dark out here. And I was like, I, I knew this wasn't the case, but I was just trying to get her to not focus on the darkness. I was like, oh, the windows are tinted. It's fine. It's fine. When we got there and she stepped out, she says, looks at me, she goes, the windows are tinted, huh? Because it was dark, dark. But, you know, after 30, 45 minutes, I, 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 now we had run and we were coming back. And I was like, hey, look over your shoulder. There comes the sun because <laughs> it starts peeking up a little bit. Now, at that point, it was too late for us. I'm like, now we get in the car now that we've run in the dark. But, hey, that's what in Isaiah chapter 9 it says the people were in the darkness and in the dimness. There was no light. It seemed like everything was a struggle. Everything was bad. And they're like, oh, God, when are you going to send the Messiah? He says, the people that dwelled in darkness, they seen a great light because there was going to be a child born. And it was like looking over there at that horizon. Everything's dark. But wait, is it just me or does it seem like on the horizon there it's starting to lighten a little bit? And after a little bit, it's a little more light, a little bit until there's the sun blazing. Yes, Isaiah 9, they lived in darkness, but there was a light coming. It was a child that would be born. In the book of Malachi, I told you about the darkness that was there. And again, the word dark or darkness, those words aren't mentioned in Malachi, but it can be felt the way that the people were living. And God, God pronounced that, hey, there's going to be a time of judgment soon. But in the last chapter of Malachi, that's not all that he says. There's judgment coming. But then he also says, yes, judgment is coming, but the son, S-U-N, it's actually capitalized again, talking about Jesus it says, the son of righteousness would arise with healing in his wings. So there was darkness, but the light was coming. There was darkness, but there was still hope. After Malachi, chronologically speaking in Scripture, what's the next thing that happens? Matthew chapter 1 and 2, Luke chapter 1 and 2, we're told of Jesus, the Messiah, the pronouncement of his birth, and then his birth told in Luke chapter 2. Jesus, the light of the world, was born. Consider the different, different images that we see and the different, the different representations of light that we see at the birth of Christ. The angels appeared to the shepherds. And what do we read in Luke chapter 2, verses 8 and 9? And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night, so it's dark. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were so afraid. It was at night, it was dark. And that was representative of what all people were going through, what all mankind had been through. It was a time of darkness. But at the birth of the Messiah, the angels came forth. And it wasn't the glory of the angels that shone forth. It says it was the glory of the Lord that shone forth. In that dark night, I, I talked about this a little bit Wednesday night. In that dark night, everything's darkness. There's no city lights. There's no electricity in that day. So there's nothing taking away from the darkness. They're out there in the dark, and suddenly the glory of the Lord is shining all around them. I think it was probably like the middle of the day in that moment. Like suddenly the light was shining so brightly. We, we, we consider that source of light there when the angel appeared to the shepherds. Over in Matthew chapter 2, we see the star that led the wise men to the child Jesus. Matthew 2, 1 and 2. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. Much has been said about that star of Bethlehem. Much has been said about the star that led them. It wasn't you just happen to glance up and see a random star. Like this had to be a pretty big deal for these guys to notice this particular star and, and, and feel that if we just follow that star, it'll take us where we need to get to, where we need to get to. And so they followed this star, this source of light. And of course, we come back to John chapter 1. Jesus, in him was life. And the life was the light of men. And the light shined in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. 
Later in the book of John, Jesus said this, John 8, 12. Then Jesus spake again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Yes, darkness seems pervasive. Darkness seems to be all around us, but the light still shines, the light of Jesus Christ. Jesus is not only the light here on the earth as we see it now, but there'll come a day in eternity where he is the everlasting light. At the, book of, in, at the end of the book of Revelation, again, John is writing this also. Revelation 21, 23, we read this, And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon to shine on it. For the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. Amen. The light of God. Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, He is the light that shines in the darkest of nights. And so when he came to this earth, he came bringing light into darkness. We look around, we see our world is dark. There's so much darkness and depravity around us. We see that so much sinfulness, and I didn't even mention the church. I mean, so much of the church today looks just like the world and acts just like the world. It is so hard to see the light sometimes when God's own representatives look so much like the darkness. But listen, there is light, there is hope, there is life. Because Jesus Christ was born in that stable over 2,000 years ago. He was born not just so that we can have a Christmas play and have, uh, you know, cute little props of a little manger and, and, and think about these things. No, he was born not to stay a baby that we worship in that manger. He was born because he was going to grow and he was going to live his life, a perfect, sinless life. And about the age of 33, he was going to suffer and he was going to die on a cruel Roman cross. We, we have crosses like this and it looks so neat and it's pretty. It's a, you know, a couple like one by four or something up there. And it, it looks nice and neat because it was run through a mill and it was, you know, flattened out and everything looks good about it. The cross that Jesus died on didn't look that neat. It wasn't that pretty. It was rough. And no doubt there was probably blood on the cross because I doubt they gave each person a new cross. So probably someone else's blood was on that cross already that Jesus hung from. Pieces of skin. And I, our Savior suffered on that cross. That baby born and placed in the manger hung on the cross because he was bringing light into a dark world. He was bringing life and he was bringing hope. And we look around our world in the darkness, sometimes it scares us. Maybe, maybe growing up or maybe still, you're scared of the dark. Lights go out and you're like, that's it. I, I need a light. I need something. Help me. I'm scared. Maybe that happens. Uh, many people struggle with a fear of the dark. But listen, when we look around our world and we see the darkness, we don't have to be scared. We don't have to be confused because things seem darker and darker. Uh, at Christmas time, we celebrate that the, that the light of life, the light of the world, Jesus Christ came into this dark world shining brightly. But Jesus didn't just come just to shine a light, just to bring a little bit of light into a dark world. There's the darkness of the land. There's the dawning of the light. But let us see why did Jesus come? And that's finally the deliverance of the lost. You see, the world is dark. We needed a light, so Jesus came. But why? It wasn't just to light the world. And look, it's, it's an okay place now because it's lighter. No, he came to deliver the lost. He, he didn't come just to shine a light into our lives so that we could see how bad we were. But that's part of it. He, he didn't just come to shine a light so we could see how bad other people are. But that's part of it. And I, I say that not to mean like, <laughs> whoa, they're really bad. Have you seen? No, not so that we can be judgmental in that way. But you know what? They are just like I was. They are lost and separated from God. They are living a life of darkness. They need the Savior just like I did. And so we see that he shined the light. So yes, we could see others' needs for the light. But it wasn't just so that we could see how bad we were. Or others could see how bad they were. Jesus came to shine light in the darkness. So that upon recognizing how hopeless our situation was, how messed up we are, that we would see there was only one way. Only one way to have our sins forgiven. Only one way to have true light brought into our lives. Only one way to be delivered from that darkness, and that was through Him. 
Consider some of the things that, uh, that, that Jesus said about himself and his mission here on this earth. Luke 19.10, he said, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. In John 3, we know John 3.16. Probably if I were to ask who can quote John 3.16, a bunch of people could. If not everybody, John 3.16. If you don't know every word, you know a bunch of it. We, we know that, but we usually just focus in on that one verse and we stop there. But there's more there. Look at John 3.17 and 19. It says, For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world. Wait a second. Isn't, I thought that's what Jesus came for. I thought He came to show us how bad we are. He didn't come to show us how bad we are. It says he came not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He didn't come to condemn us. Look what the next verse says. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. Because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation that light is come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. See, Jesus didn't come to say, you're bad, you're bad, you're bad, you're bad, you're all condemned. He didn't have to do that. We just are, apart from him, we just are sinners. We just are bad. We just are condemned. But he didn't come to condemn us. He came to provide a way to not be condemned. He came to shine a light so that we could see the way to be free from our sins. He, he came to give us the way to eternal life. Matthew 9, 12 through 13, it says, But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, They that behold need not a physician, but they that are sick. Go ye and learn what that meaneth. I will have mercy and not sacrifice, for I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Come back to John chapter 1. We look at the last few verses of our text this morning. John 1, verses 12 through 14. But as many as received him, as many as received Jesus Christ, as many as recognize that He is the light, He is the life, He is the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come to the Father but by Him. As, though, as many of those who received Him, to them gave He power to become the sons of God. Even to them that believe on His name, which were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory the glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And deliverance from sin that's talked about. That power to become the sons of, and daughters of God, it wasn't just for those alive in John chapter 1. That's for all of us. That free gift of salvation is for all of us. That light that has come into the darkness is for all of us. That life that came from Jesus is for all of us. We must simply receive it. You see, Jesus died to pay for the penalty of our sins. He died in our place, a substitutionary sacrifice in our place to take our sins on Him. The worst thing you've ever done, Jesus took it. But you know what? Even that thing that you think is not so bad, Jesus took that too. He came for all sins of all mankind for all of time. And He died on the cross to shine the light, to say, I'll take this you receive me, you place your faith in me, and I'll give you life eternal. And so we see deliverance of the lost. The world is dark. It can seem like a scary place oftentimes. It can get us down as we see all that's going on, but the light of Christ can overcome the darkness. If you find yourself in a dark room and you don't know where you're at, what do you need? You, even if you don't have like, a flashlight, a spotlight. You see this in movies sometimes, like anyone have a match. And you just strike a match. And even, a match is only going to last a few seconds. But if you strike a match, at least that is enough to kind of get you where you're going, kind of give you some direction. Listen, Jesus didn't come to just provide this momentary light, just this little bit of light to show us the way. He came and he shined like this massive spotlight. I remember growing up in Mobile, we would be going out to eat or something. I would see in the, light, in, in the sky this, this light going back and forth like this. And inevitably what it was, once we got near Airport Boulevard down there, kind of the main strip there in Mobile, one of the car lots, big car lot, they've got this massive spotlight out front doing like this to get people's attention. Got my attention. 
It was this massive light shining, and it didn't matter how dark it was, that light would break that darkness, and you could see that. Hey, hey comic book fans, Batman, someone wants to signal Batman, what do they use? The big light, the bat signal, right? The light that would shine in the darkness. Listen, that's just a fun little story. But I'm telling you, there's a light greater than any of those. Jesus Christ, the light, the life, the way, the truth, the word who was made flesh and dwelt among us. He came and his light was not momentary. His light was not just one that could be seen in one spot for one time. The light of the Lord is available to all. And he's shining, saying, hey, all who are weary, you're sick of your sin. You're bogged down in that. You can't find a way out. That's because you haven't looked to me. I'm the only way. And he shines the light on himself, saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. And so it doesn't matter how dark the world gets. The light of God cannot be dimmed. We look around and it may seem like it's getting dimmer and dimmer because God's people are, are wandering off from him. The world is worse and worse. And it seems like the light isn't there anymore. But listen, the light of of Jesus Christ is shining as bright as ever we just have to look at him we just have to turn to him if you've never placed your faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior I'm here to tell you you're the reason he came you're the reason he left glory left heaven left that perfection and all that, that is involved in heaven he left that and he came to this earth this dark world this place where at that point there had been 400 years of silence and darkness from God 400 years and Jesus stepped out of glory for you. He came to this earth, as I've already said, to live that perfect sinless life. He came to this earth to die on a cross to take the weight of your sins, the punishment of your sins on himself. Why would he do that? And now we get back to John 3.16. For God so loved. Who? The world. That's all of us. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus willingly left heaven's throne, willingly left glory to come to this earth to live as a man, to suffer as a man, to die on a cruel Roman cross to pay for your sins. If you've never received Him as your Savior, I beg you, call out to Him today. Let that light into your life. He will save you from your sins and give you a home in heaven. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to clean up yourself. Well, well, first let me get better. Well, first let me do more. Well, first let me give some money to the church. Hey, give money to the church. I'm fine with that. But that's not going to get you any closer to heaven. Being a better person, turning over a new leaf, doing something for the poor, serving in a soup kitchen, none of that will get you to heaven. Only through Jesus Christ and faith in Him can you ever have a home in heaven. Amen. For God's people here today, those who have placed their faith in, in Jesus, He is the light of the world. But in Matthew chapter 5, there's something interesting that's said. Matthew chapter 5 verses 14 through 16 says this. This is Jesus speaking. This is part of the Sermon on the Mount. So like the most famous sermon ever that Jesus ever preached or anybody else. In Matthew chapter 5, towards the beginning of that sermon, he said these words. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine that they may see your good works. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Jesus Christ, the light of the world, looked at his followers and said, you are the light of the world. Let your light go and shine. Is the world dark? Yeah. But how many of us are shining a light into that darkness? How many of us are reflecting the light of Jesus Christ? It's kind of like the moon. The moon reflects the light of the sun. Believers ought to reflect the light of the sun also, S-O-N. We ought to be a reflection of Jesus Christ. We are to be the light of this world. We are to show forth the glory and the praise of our, our, our wonderful Savior, Jesus Christ. Are we doing our part to bring light into this world? He's done everything necessary and any calls on us to be the light. Yes, the world is dark. But Jesus is the light that shines through that darkness, splits that darkness wide open, shines into that, showing men, women, boys and girls their need of a Savior and saying, I am that Savior that you need.
Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word today. Thank you that Jesus Christ came. Thank you that he is the light of the world. And he calls each of us to reflect that light, to be a light to those that are lost in this world that need to hear of a Savior. Lord, I pray that each one of your children today would, would, would be right with you and be a light in this dark world. Lord, that we would show forth your praise, show forth your light, tell others about what you've done in our lives. Lord, if there's one here that's never trusted Christ as their Savior, may they receive him today. May something that's been said or something they read today be, be a light into their darkness and, and, and will expose that they are in need of a Savior. Lord, I pray that you would have your will and way in all that's said and done the remainder of this service. In Jesus' name, amen.